Welcome to our 13th Outlook webinar for 2017 and today's review of the current projected outlook for project spending and investments across the meat and poultry market. My name is Michael Bergen, Executive Vice President based in our Sugarland office and I'll be your moderator today. Before we get started, I'd like to give a warm thank you to our webinar sponsor, Victory Energy. Victory Energy is a leading provider of industrial boilers and heat transfer solutions and services across the upstream and downstream markets. From bid to startup, Victory Energy can assist you in every step of the way. I'm delighted to be joined today by Randy Goddard. Randy is our global head of research for the food and beverage industry, as well as covering research for the pulp and paper market too as well. Randy and I are based in the Sugarland office and will be leading the discussion today. IRR's coverage spans across 12 industrial markets. In terms of agenda today, we'll be taking a quick look at our food and beverage industry with a deep dive review into the meat and poultry market for North America. Our discussion today will be assessing the spending outlook for the next 12 months and the trends that are setting the stage for this period. Before we dive into the meat and poultry industry sector, it may be good to highlight the various states within North America that are spending money across the sector um, in the food and beverage market. In this one view, we've captured spending from 2013 to 2018 and given a heat map perspective of where that spending has uh, taken shape. Um, in this view, we're representing 7,782 projects worth $85 billion. Those numbers are not um, to be ignored, especially when we're dealing with industries across the 12 sectors that are struggling. Randy, could you begin the discussion with a brief understanding of which sectors in the food and beverage industry are expecting to perform well over the next 24 months? And obviously this would be excluding the, um, the meat and poultry market. Sure. First of all, uh, thank you to our participants for joining us today. Uh, the food and beverage industry across North America is, is resilient and strong. However, there are some weak points. There are some sectors that are, will not perform as well as they have in, in recent years. On the, others, on the flip side, um, the, there are sectors that are expected to outperform their past performance, uh, namely the prepared food sector, which uh, is being driven by a shift from legacy products to options that are more uh, healthy, convenient. Uh, primarily, uh, that market is being driven by millennials that are, that are calling for newer products that uh, serve a, a better, healthier cause overall. Another sector that is, that is expected to perform well over the coming 12-month uh, period is the beverage sector. Now, most people consider the beverage sector to be under fire because there's been a lot of talk of sugary, sugary beverages, among soft drinks, and, and juices. However, uh, we take a, a different viewpoint and expect that the drivers for that category will be uh, bottled water, uh, breweries, uh, wine, and liquor. Those three categories will drive capital expenditures within the beverage sector. Another, another part of the industry that uh, is expected to perform well coming along here shortly will be the agribusiness side of it. This is primarily uh, storage and um, movement of, of product from, from the farm to the processing plant. Uh, there's a surplus of grain on the market and there's still room for um, building of facilities to store and move those products. And so we expect to see continued uh, expansion plans and new building construction for those facilities. And that, that, those are primarily, those will be the areas of the industry that will drive spending over the next 24 months. Very good, Randy. Thank you. And geographically, we can see that the food and beverage industry is, for the most part, it does span across many states of North America, uh, with hot spots being in Texas, California, and then some of your Midwest area um, 
Iowa, Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, so on and so forth. Um, but I want to take your attention over to this one summary annually of our construction starts data. So this comes out of our database and uh, just given a viewpoint from 2013 on through to 2018, how we have seen the trend rise for spending across the food and beverage market. So we went from $9 billion in 2013 to $13 billion in 14, uh, keeping at that level through 15. And then in 16, we actually saw about a $2 billion jump up in spending. Um, and as we look forward into the market, we even see that using our probability factors that we have a very small in that red line uh, portion of the spending that's been identified that um, is in a low probability state. Um, could you elaborate on some of the upward trends that we're seeing there, Randy? Sure, and I'll, I'll try to, to do this real quickly. Going back to 2013, is really the opening of the pipeline of products that were being held up due to the global downturn at that point. There was a lot of pent up demand for projects. And as the market began to turn, we started seeing those projects uh, moving through the pipeline through 2013 all the way to 2015. Sort of didn't really peak much from 2015 to 2016, but I think the what, what really speaks to the trend is this, is this globalization, this globalization in respect to uh, the emerging markets, middle class income, uh, a shift from eating foods that they uh, that people grew in these countries and moving into more of a convenience foods. The, the the another driver for this trend in upward spending is the fact that we're we're becoming a leading exporter in in some of these marketplaces. In 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 some markets we were uh, not the biggest provider and, and that's that's certainly changed um, Asia has opened up uh, a, a huge huge avenues for uh, some of our products uh, which we'll get into here in, in the next few slides but in, in short the 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 trend that's ahead of us moving into 2017 and 2018 is one that can't be ignored simply due to the fact that the the U.S. is a is a global provider to the marketplace. Domestically, our demand is strong. The, uh, the international markets is demanding more product uh, across all sectors, and more so in in certain ones. And again, we'll get into that here in a few in, in a few minutes. Uh, but 2017, 2018, uh, we might see some fallout. The overall expectation is that this this growth of expansion is, is something that's sustainable. It has to be one that will move us into the future of being a global provider, not just in the short term, but also in the long term. Very good. Thank you, Randy. Yeah, and I'd like to just back up that our outlook for 2017 and 2018 seem to be robust statistically just from the view of the projects that we've identified in the, in the system. Uh, so that's a good good indicator. Now, getting started in the meat and poultry sector, I want to bring our attention back to a demographics map and just show the distribution of spending across the states and just use this as a point for you to enter into our discussion today. Sure. I mean, when you look at this map, uh, there are certain regions that speak to specific categories of the meat and poultry sector. Take, for example, looking at the southeast, Georgia is the leading state for poultry production. You move over to the Midwest, that's where primarily um, where most of our beef and, and pork products are, are, are grown and processed. Texas has become one of the leading states in terms of overall food processing, particularly with regard to, to, to the meat and poultry sector. There's a huge amount of spend taking place within that state primarily for poultry production um, uh, there are plans to build uh, some new facilities uh, from ground up uh, as well as the related facilities uh, meaning uh, poultry processing plants the feed mills and the grain stock uh, to provide uh, support for those uh, new plants so when you look at the map overall i think that the highlighted areas really speak to uh, specific sectors of the meat and poultry industry. Very good. Thank you, Randy. 
So when we jump into what I would call one of the more fascinating maps that come out of our geolocator tool, um, we can take that same, same information and create a true heat map that shows the concentration down to the plant level where that activity is. So in this one view, um, we're identifying 71 new facilities that uh, are anticipated to start construction over the next 24 months and where those plants are located. Um, can you elaborate some on this? And I, I did find it fascinating that we actually do see some new facilities being proposed and built up in the Canadian region. Yes. Uh, most people may not be aware, but Canada is a major provider of, of uh, meat products, specifically pork production. Uh, they have some really large facilities there, and one of the major uh, companies there has engaged in a long-term plan to expand and build new facilities to service the export market as well. So Canada, uh, to some, may seem like a sleeper, but in fact, it is a, a, a major provider of, of meat product. Looking a little bit further south um, into the U.S., I mentioned earlier uh, that certain regions speak to certain sectors. In this particular slide, we wanted to point out specifically the grassroots construction. And I think what's really interesting about this is if you you can't really see it as much, but if you look towards uh, the area of Pennsylvania and New Jersey, Delaware area, that's uh, highlighted on this map. There are plans to build a new poultry processing facilities there. As a matter of fact, um, one of the largest poultry companies in the country uh, has plans for a 2018 startup of a new facility there that's one of the largest poultry processing projects on record for, for the near future. Moving on down to Mexico, Mexico is a leading importer of pork products from the U.S. However, they are some ways away from building their own production, and that that area that you see there is somewhat indicative of where they're going. I mean, they're still a long way. The investment level is, is relatively small. However, they're still building. And Randy, I would assume is that um, capacity in Mexico being proposed? Is that for North or is, or is that for the U.S. and possibly for I think Canada? That, uh, no, that that capacity will be for domestic construct consumption, the internal. Okay. With respect to just Mexico, they're not exporting. Right. 